How is insect metamorphosis controlled? I'm interested in various aspects of the process in this insect, the tobacco hornworm. It's fairly obvious that all those changes of size and shape are a fairly complex bit of developmental biology. There must be a fairly sophisticated control system which controls just when all those things happen. What's exciting is that we understand at least the basics of that control system. It seems to depend on the interplay of three hormones. Let's begin the story at the beginning. Here's a caterpillar. How does it know when to molt, and how does it know how to molt? Here's a spiracle, one of the openings the caterpillar breathes through. The pale larger ring surrounding it is the outline of a new bigger spiracle being laid down underneath. To see what's happening more clearly, we need to use an electron microscope. Insect cuticle is deposited by a layer of epidermal cells. First, the old cuticle becomes separated from the epidermis and a space appears between them. This is called apolysis. Molting fluid, a mixture of enzymes, is secreted into this space. This digests away most of the old cuticle. Meanwhile, a new cuticle is being laid down. First, a thin waterproof epicuticle is deposited, and then, underneath, a much thicker procuticle. Just before apolysis, the epidermis proliferates rapidly and so increases in size. This results in the epidermis being thrown into folds, and we can see this on a scanning EM picture of the new cuticle. It's already larger than the old cuticle which enclosed it. Eventually, the remains of the old cuticle are sloughed off in the spectacular event which entomologists call ecdysis, which is, of course, what most people think of as molting. 
But molting is a much longer process than just ecdysis. First, the insect has to lay down a new cuticle underneath the old one. Apolysis can precede ecdysis by anything from a day to several weeks. What we're going to ask is, what initiates that whole molting process? It's a question which we can answer really quite well, mainly because it's possible to manipulate insects in a way that simply isn't possible in vertebrates. To understand why, you need to know a little about insect anatomy. Here's a caterpillar cut open. Let's take a look under the microscope. Here's the gut. These tubes fanning out from the spiracles are the insect's tracheal system. They supply the tissues with oxygen direct from the air. Note that there are no blood vessels. Each tissue is simply bathed in hemolymph, which can carry the messages of hormonal control without having to bother with respiratory gases. Because of this, we can tie a ligature around the caterpillar's body. By doing that, we can divide the various body fragments from each other. The divided body fragments will survive for weeks. By doing this, we can interfere with the insect's nervous and hormonal control systems. Let's take a look at the insect's central nervous system. Here's the brain. It's relatively small. There's also a chain of segmental ganglia. Here's the first one. When we tie ligatures around the body, the ganglia will be prevented from communicating with one another, but also the endocrine glands will be isolated in particular body compartments. Ligature experiments are very important in insect endocrinology. We can use them to locate an endocrine gland within the body. In this experiment, we are assessing the importance of the head in the control of molting. Ligatures are tied around the neck and we then wait to see if the rest of the body will molt. We can also work out when a particular hormone is released. If we tie the ligature before the hormone is secreted, the animal won't molt. If it's tied after hormone release, then it will. This is the result of a head ligature experiment from three days ago. The control larvae have just molted. The ligatured animals don't appear to have done much. But maybe we're being a bit unfair because when we tied the ligature around the neck, we deprived the animal of its motor centers in its brain. But we can make use of the double spiracle effect that we saw earlier to see if there's a new cuticle being laid down. This is a larva which was ligatured 60 hours before it was due to molt. There's no large pale ring, no double spiracle. Obviously, something in the head is required for molting. In fact, it's the brain. Not so surprising when you think about it. But if I implant a brain into the body of this neck ligatured caterpillar, then it will go on to molt. This not only shows that the brain is responsible for molting, but also that proper nervous connections aren't needed. The brain must be secreting a hormone into the blood. But this hormone doesn't act directly. This is a caterpillar which a few days ago I ligatured behind the thorax. And then I implanted a brain into the isolated abdomen. Let's have a look. There's no sign of a new cuticle in the isolated abdomen, so there must be something extra in the thorax needed for molting. 
This something is the prothoracic gland. It's a hormone secreted by the prothoracic gland which actually causes molting. The brain simply activates the prothoracic glands. We know this because if we extirpate the glands, then the insect can no longer molt. If we reimplant the prothoracic glands, then the ability to molt is restored. The product of the prothoracic glands is a steroid called ecdysone. It seems that ecdysone is not the true molting hormone, but a precursor, a prohormone. It's converted in the tissues where it acts to 20 hydroxy ecdysone, which is the true molting hormone. By contrast, the hormone secreted by the brain, prothoracic atropic hormone, or PTTH, is a peptide. We don't yet know its precise structure, but we think it has a relative molecular mass of about 5,000. We can locate the precise site of PTTH synthesis in the brain by bioassay techniques. With the right lighting, the cells that do the job show up in this region of the brain. We can selectively stain a pair of neurosecretory cells here on each side of the brain. Only one cell of each pair contains PTTH. It seems incredible that Manduka should rely ultimately on just two cells to control one of the most critical activities of its life. So that's where the hormones come from. But when are they secreted? Ligature experiments can tell us the answer. Let's start with PTTH. What we're trying to discover is the time at which it's released from the neurosecretory cells in the brain. We'll ligature between the head and the thorax at different times before the predicted time of ecdysis. From experience, we know that we need to begin about 60 hours before ecdysis, which we'll call time zero. We'll take eight groups of 100 larvae and ligature each group at a different time. We then wait and count the number of larvae that subsequently show signs of molting. In the first group, ligatured 56 hours before ecdysis, no larvae molt. In the next group, just four, and in the next, 18, and so on. It seems that a larva is unlikely to molt if a ligature is put on earlier than minus 54 hours, but it is virtually certain to molt if the ligature is put on later than minus 49 hours. PTTH must therefore be released over a critical period, 54 to 49 hours before ecdysis. But we still don't know when ecdysone is released. We can use exactly the same technique to work this out. Now we tie the ligatures between the thorax and the abdomen. This time, the critical period seems to be between 47 and 39 hours before ecdysis. So it's over this time interval that ecdysone is released. To summarize our experiment, PTTH is released about 54 to 49 hours before ecdysis. Then there's a short delay. Ecdysone is released over the period 47 to 39 hours before molting. So it takes PTTH one or two hours to fully activate the prothoracic gland. But what is it that triggers PTTH release? Well, we're not absolutely sure, but we think that it's something to do with size. In order to initiate the molt to the fifth instar, this fourth instar caterpillar must exceed a certain critical body weight. And what's more, it must do it by a certain time of day, round about the time that the lights go off. This one didn't make it. 
So this enables me to predict with almost 100% accuracy that this group of larvae will initiate the molt to the fifth thin star tomorrow. But this group of larvae will have to wait for another chance on the following day. This is because PTTH release appears to be restricted to a certain part of the day. This is governed by a biological clock in the brain. The clock may actually be in the PTTH cells themselves. This is a very useful phenomenon because it enables me to take a synchronously developing group of larvae. Obviously a very helpful thing in experiments like these. What we've covered so far tells us about the initiation of the molt. But how does the caterpillar know when to leave the plant and begin the sequence of changes which leads to a pupal molt? This is where our third hormone comes in, but it's the absence of this hormone that turns out to be important. We can cause the caterpillar to get it wrong by experimental manipulation. This is a miniature pupa. Here's the normal size version for comparison. The miniature pupa was produced by removing two small paired glandular pieces of tissue from just behind the brain of a fourth instar larva. If we implant those same pieces of glandular tissue into a fifth instar larva, then we get not a pupa, but a sixth instar giant larva. Look, he's a real monster. Let's weigh him. Fourteen grams. That's nearly half as much again as the biggest fifth instar larva ever weighs. Which gland causes these changes? It's not the brain, but it's linked to the brain by these two nerves. It's this gland here, called the corpus alatum. We'll take a closer look at the gland, starting in the center. The cells contain whorls of smooth ER. They're synthesizing a group of related hormones called juvenile hormones because they promote the retention of juvenile features. We call them JHs for short. The corpus alatum also contains neurosecretory axons. These terminals in the outer sheath connect up with the PTTH cells in the brain. So this is where PTTH is released. These other neurosecretory cells are in the center of the gland. We're not really sure, but they may have something to do with the control of JH secretion. The juvenile hormones are basically long-chain esterified fatty acids. This unusual epoxide group here appears to be essential for their activity. In fact, the juvenile hormones come in several different forms. In this respect, they're rather like the vertebrate corticosteroids. We're not quite sure of the different functions of the different JHs. It may be that like the corticosteroids, they have slightly different but overlapping functions. The juvenile hormones appear to modify the action of ecdysone. Again, let's look at the spiracle. When JH is present, ecdysone causes the epidermal cells to make a green larval cuticle. The first sign of this is the double spiracle effect. When it's absent, ecdysone makes the cells secrete a new brown pupal cuticle, which you can see underneath the old larval one. So far, we have the basic ideas that it's ecdysone which initiates the molt being itself subject to the control of PTTH. By its presence or absence, it's JH which controls what sort of molt will occur. So we'd expect both the JH and ecdysone levels to remain high for the first four instars. But when we come to the fifth instar, the one before the pupa, we'd expect JH levels to fall to zero and ecdysone levels to remain high. Now we need to check our hypothesis by measuring the levels of the two hormones. 
For JH, we use a bioassay. This is a mutant of Manduka. As you can see, it's black. This is because it has lower than usual levels of JH in its blood. If I take a larva like this one, just before the molt, and I apply some JH to it, then in the next instar, it'll be green, not black. We can use this effect to measure the amount of JH in a test sample. The more JH we apply, the more the larva turns from black to green. We can assign each larva a numerical score, from zero, when it's completely black, then up, through the various grades, to green, which scores five. For egg disone, we use a radioamino assay. Let's have a look at the results. Juvenile hormone levels are shown by the dotted line and egg disone by the solid line. Juvenile hormone levels go down on day four, but there are two pulses of egg disone, this little pulse and this bigger one. Obviously, things are much more complicated than we expected. What's the reason? So far, we haven't looked really closely at what Manduka does in real life. So let's go back and have a closer look at the fifth instar to pupil molt. After molting to a fifth instar, the larva feeds for four days. It then undergoes some anatomical changes. The most striking is a clearing of its tissues so that we can see its dorsal heart beating through the cuticle. At about the same time, it stops feeding and leaves the plant. It begins to burrow and forms a little cave. There it rests for four days, and then it molts. Can we correlate any of these events with changes in the hormone levels? The first smaller pulse of ecdysone occurs just before feeding stops and wandering begins. This first period of ecdysone release occurs when JH is absent. This causes the exposure of the heart and wandering. It also commits the larva to form a pupa. But in order to actually cause molting, a second period of ecdysone is required. You can see that the interplay between the different hormone systems is really quite complex. Even now, we're unsure of many of the details, but we're still learning from nature. This caterpillar has been infested by a parasitic wasp. Now, the fully grown larvae are emerging. Soon, They'll spin cocoons and emerge as adults. The wasp larvae prevent the caterpillar burrowing by secreting additional JH. They also inhibit the enzymes that destroy the host's own JH. One day, we may control insect hormones for our own benefit as cleverly as does this parasite.